In this episode, I host a dialogue between Rupert Spira, a teacher of the direct path method of Advaita, and an internationally acclaimed ceramic artist, and Henry Shukman, Zen teacher and award-winning poet and writer. Well known as influential spiritual teachers, both men have also had prestigious careers in the arts. In this episode, they discuss the intersection of art and spirituality. Rupert and Henry consider such issues as the true purpose of art, narrative as a healing device, art as interruption of the subject-object distinction, the darshan of Rembrandt, and how Chekhov relates to the Vedantic witness. Rupert and Henry also reflect on their own artistic careers, including the importance of mentors, finding one's unique voice, and the relationship between discipline and spontaneity. So without further ado, Rupert Spira and Henry Shukman. Rupert Spira and Henry Shukman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Lovely Thank to be you. here. Well, I'm so delighted to be talking with both of you here today. This is really uh, such a treat for me. And uh, this whole thing sparked from the, the previous interviews that we've conducted individually, myself with Henry and, and Rupert. A key theme in those interviews has been this intersection of art and, for want of a better word, spirituality. And both of you have been acclaimed artists, careers that have uh, attracted international acclaim in the arts. Rupert yourself as a ceramic artist and Henry as a poet and writer. And have also uh, gone on to become, for want of a better term, spiritual teachers. Rupert, the, the direct path of non-duality, and Henry Zen and the Sambo Kyodan uh, lineage. And, uh, you know, I was struck by some similarities between the two of you, but also some, some more importantly, differences. I don't know if you know this, but you were both born in England, you know that part, but you were born two years apart. Rupert in 1960 and Henry in 1962. Did you know that? No, I didn't. No, no, no. Both of you uh, educated in the English public school uh, system, and both of you with quite a lot of roots in Oxford. Before we came on live here, there, we had an extensive discussion. The two of you had an extensive discussion about the geography <laughs> of Oxford, um, where Rupert's now living and where Henry went to school, the Dragon School. Perhaps I'll say something about, uh, just a hint really, about each of your artistic arcs. Uh, Rupert, you've been described as among the finest ceramicists of your generation and were active as a potter for over 30 years. And your work remains in private and public collections throughout the world, including the V&A, the Fitzwilliam Museum, the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts and the National Museum of Modern Art, Tokyo. And Henry, your first poetry collection in Dr. No's Garden won the Gerwood Alderborough Poetry Prize in 2003, and it was Book of the Year in the Times and the Guardian. And in 2004, you were selected as the next generation poet. And as a fiction writer, your book Sandstorm and Lost City won various awards, too many to list, but among them, Authors Club First Novel Award in 2006. You're a finalist in the O. Henry Award, um, and your books have been Guardian Book of the Year, National Geographic Book of the Month, and so on. And you're a poet in residence at the Wordsworth Trust. So many viewers, I think, and listeners of this podcast will be more familiar with both of you, naturally, for your spiritual teaching activities. Um, but uh, I think remarkable careers in the arts also. And so who better, I think, to have a discussion like this? Uh, but, you know, despite these similarities, your arcs do have some striking differences. And I may misrepresent you a bit here, so do feel free to correct me when we when we come round to that. Rupert, we, we remarked in our interview that your arc as an artist and as a spiritual teacher followed a similar pattern, almost a traditional model of discipleship to a master or mentor, Michael Cardew in pottery and Francis Lucille in the, the direct path and subsequent graduation from those relationships to develop your own voice in those mediums. And Henry, your path was characterized by what you've described as lone wolfing. And you write in, in your uh, memoir, One Blade of Grass, snarling with distrust. Uh, and then eventually coming to work one-on-one -on -one with Zen teachers. Um, that process had very transformative consequences for you. I think quite different. And there are many, many other differences, but perhaps 
To me, the most intriguing one, and the inspiration for this dialogue, is the effect that your spiritual journeys had on your art. I'll come to an end shortly. And Rupert, in your previous interview, you said that as you deepened into your uh, spiritual unfolding or uh, explorations, your art actually was liberated, particularly as you resolved your an inner conflict uh, between beauty and truth. And Henry, yeah, you've yeah. described your Zen path as having knocked out, and this is a quote now from our interview, knocked out a core of angst that had been somehow wrapped up in the energy of the creative process and that you were pervaded by peace and in fact stopped writing uh, for many years. So I'd like to invite each of you to begin with to reflect a little on this theme and however it seems interesting or appropriate, this intersection um, between art and, and your spiritual interests, these twin trajectories that both of you have, have uh, had. Rupert, perhaps you could begin. Goodness, Steve, it's hard to know exactly where to begin with an introduction like that. Um, let me begin with perhaps just saying very briefly what I consider the purpose of art or, or the ultimate purpose of art to be. And it is simply this, to reveal the nature of reality. Which is, in fact, exactly what all uh, religious, uh, spiritual traditions aim to do in, in one way or another, to, to precipitate this recognition of the nature of reality. Uh, uh, unlike the spiritual traditions, which tend to use um, uh, words, the, the written word or the spoken word, m most teaching takes place through writing and speaking and, and of course through silent meditations. Unlike the spiritual uh, uh, teaching traditions, the, the arts use um, they use words in the case of uh, writing, but they use our uh, faculty of sense perception to uh, uh, reveal the reality that the spiritual traditions uh, 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 reveal through through language. And although it wasn't, uh, I didn't formulate this for for um, until. I had been working as an, art, as an artist for many years. I'm quite sure that the reason I embarked on a life uh, as an artist was because my, my first in introduction uh, and the first time I, I think we spoke about this, uh, Steve, in my in our last conversation, the first time I saw an exhibition of Michael Cardew's uh, when I was 15 years old at the Camden Art Center, it was like this, um, it was such a powerful, visceral, energetic experience that it would, it, it was like a, a kind of crack in my world. It opened me up to a new possibility. So this exhibition was like a kind of initiation for me. So um, I, although I didn't formulate it to myself in these terms at the time, the, 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 the process, uh, my, my training and my subsequent life as a potter, what was a means of exploring, yes, outwardly in one way form material processes substances but but it was part of an uh, um a deeper inner exploration at the same time so so it was both um uh, my, my work as an artist was a means of exploring reality but also a means of expressing it and i feel that that this is really what why we have art in our culture r really art you know, in, in a culture where, where, where people are, are often struggle to, 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 to survive, to earn a living, to, to bring up a family, to, just to exist, one would think that art would be the first casualty of such a society, that, that art would, that, that it would be considered superfluous. But this is not the case. Um, all primitive societies uh, that, that, that were highly developed, or most, primitive societies were highly developed artistically. In, in, indeed, in there, there are stories from uh, concentration camps where people made art in the most terrible circumstances. Why didn't these activities disappear in favor of the more urgent um, activities of, of, of simply surviving? It's because I think art is something 
absolutely fundamental to us as, as human beings. It is a means by which we both explore and express the nature of reality in a, in a non, not always a non-verbal, because of course literature and poetry are included in art, but, but using all of our senses, in, in, in my case, in terms of ceramics and touch and, 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 and sight in terms of music, sound, um, in terms of cooking tastes, uh, uh, but it, it's a it's a, a, a an exploration and a communication of reality that doesn't just use our conceptual powers; it uses our perceptual powers, our faculty of perception. And uh, as I again, I think I mentioned this in our conversation, Steve. I I know n no better expression of this in the Western tradition than than Cezanne, who was explicit about this, and he said that the purpose of my paintings is to take the viewer to, to nature's eternity, to that which is eternal or, or that which is real in nature. So why, do, why don't I, I leave it at that for the moment? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very beautiful, actually. Uh, and uh, I hardly want to trespass on it by saying anything. Very beautiful. So so right, so true, so clear, and brings us right back to here and now, and the wonder of just being here, really, together like this. Wow. Ah. Well, I guess I've got to say something. So <laughs> um, I, I, I can relate to a lot of what Rupert has just said. Um, I think my own a, a deep similarity that I, I want to jump on first is that, you know, I, I, um, I kind of discovered poetry somewhere in my, I mean, I think before the age of 10, even with a dear friend of mine, Sam Willits, who's a great poet, who also went to the Dragon School. He also was a child of academics like myself. In fact, our mothers were great friends and used to wheel us in our prams side by side in the parks um, as infants. But, you know, it's at a certain point in, in our early life at the Dragon School, Sam and I started discovering something alive in words. And we would, I remember kind of pouring through books in the little school library, searching for lines that brought something to life within us, some sense of, um, well, of beauty and more than that, some truth, some kind of natural order of things that certain, uh, especially images that we could discover in here and there as we sort of ransack books for them, that, that brought us to life or brought something in us to life that recognized um, yeah, something about reality that we didn't normally see and we probably couldn't have articulated even that much about it at the time, but we knew what we were looking for. And um, <clears throat> it, set, it set me on a path of exploration of reality that I recognized somehow that there was a way of experiencing this very moment, any moment, my life, that was not like, not the way I normally experienced it. And this came to a head uh, forcefully for me when I was 13 years old. I was up in my bedroom um, at home, uh, very near where Rupert is now sitting, actually. We were just talking about that in the same street, a few houses up. I was looking out of the window and it was the end of summer and the school term was soon going to begin again and the annual fun fair, St Giles Fair, was, had just started. And um, I, I, I was already by this time, you know, I'd, I'd written a, a number of poems and I'd read a lot of poetry and I was, you know, it was, it was already seeming to be a, a path for me. And I, but that, that evening, as I was sort of gazing out the window, uh, the sun had gone down and, and, and the stars were coming out and I could just see the lights of the fair in the distance over the rooftops. And um, 
I was suddenly kind of seized by a need to write a poem. Once again, that wasn't the first time, but it was different this time. I, 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 I found a, a, a phrase forming in my mind and I just wrote it down and I kept going with phrase after phrase followed. And um, I had kind of given in in some way to allow a kind of expression to come through that, that was new for me. I hadn't experienced writing a poem that way before. It was, a, it was an immediate means of experiencing the moment at hand in a much more intimate way. And my body came alive. I was tingling and shaking and I, I was alive in a new way. And, and the, what that new way consisted of uh, above all was a, a sense of this moment, this, this experience going on right now being met with a force and an intimacy that I had not known before. And so it was at one and the same time, a way of being alive. In other words, a sort of meeting or, or inhabiting this moment of reality, just as it is. And at the same time, being able somehow to express it. it I think it, it, it matches very much with what you were just saying, Rupert, that it's, it's about exploring reality or, or, or coming to know it in different ways and somehow that is bound up with the expression of it all in one and i i knew you know this is how i want to live this is what it means to me to be alive this is the most alive i've ever been and um and it uh it's sort of a my my fate was cast or whatever it was going to be poetry you know and for the next de few decades well in a two three decades or whatever in in various twists and turns and in some somewhat difficult ways and in some very blessed ways i i forged a life where i was supported by writing and where um it it was it was my highest priority really, or at least it was the central priority because it was the means to, in my maybe more crass and not so clear way of just saying, of really being alive. And yeah, maybe I'll pause there. Maybe I should add, I suppose that in that sense, you know, I guess I would have to say that, you know, from the start, it was in some sense a spiritual pursuit. If, if by spirituality we mean um, coming to an experience or a, a way of experiencing that is much closer to this moment, that's much, I mean, uh, it's not quite what I want to say, but, you know, that is where something is, our life is not quite our own. You know, we're not so isolated. We're, we're participating in some force of life that is, um, that does not, in which we're not an isolated, separated entity, but somehow more intimate with, with it all. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely hit pause now. <laughs> so many things that you've said, Henry, that I could respond to. Let me, let me respond to the last thing you said, because it's a word, you used the word intimacy uh, quite a few times. And I, I would agree with you. I would express it slightly differently. And, and that, and I, but I think it's the same experience that you're referring to, that... Um, a true work of art is is a be, be it a, a dance, a poem, a, a bowl, a meal, uh, a piece of music. A, 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 a true work of art is an is an is an object or an experience that that uh, an objective experience that that has the capacity to 
collapse the subject-object relationship. Right. And that, um, <clears throat> of course, we've all, well, the three of us, and I'm sure all of your listeners, Steve, we've all read uh, um, numerous um, descriptions um, from various traditions and have engaged in various practices whose purpose is to bring about this collapse of the subject-object relationship. And, and if, the sub, if the separate subject and object are indeed ultimately illusions, that then these practices are, their purpose is really to, to reveal reality, the, 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 the oneness of reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, a work of art, I would suggest, is a work of art whose main purpose is to collapse the apparent distinction between ourself as the subject and the object or, or, or the other. And this, I, I think if I'm right, Henry, this is what you referring to, what you referred to a number of times as, as the intimacy, the real intimacy, because the, the subject, of, in, order to, in order to know an object as an object or an other as an other, we must stand apart from that object or person as a separate subject of experience. And for, for, for most people, that this separate subject of experience is so, so obviously and unquestionably what we are, that our entire experience seems to take place in reference to ourself as this separate subject of experience. But of course, as, as we all understand, that the separate subject of experience is by definition a, a, a position of lack on the inside and potential conflict on the outside. So it, it's, it's inherently unsatisfactory. And in fact, uh, the entire, all the activities that, are, that an apparently separate subject of experience engages in, um, they, they do so with the sole purpose of divesting itself of the sense of separation, this collapse mm -hmm. of a subject-object relationship, what you refer to, Henry, as, as intimacy, this absence of otherness, absence of, of separation. And I feel that th th this is what this is what a, a true work of art has the power to do. If, it, if it's a work of art that involves words, uh, uh, prose, poetry, then it uses the faculty of, of concepts. But, but the purpose is to, to obviously to take us to, to, to a place in ourselves that is prior to conceptual, the conceptualization of experience. But, but, but if, we're, if we're talking about works of art, uh, painting, music, uh, um, dance, food, ceramics, th th these are not using our conceptual faculties, they're using our perceptual faculties. They take our senses on a journey. If you're having a meal, your, your, your senses are taken on a journey as you taste the meal. If you listen to a piece of music, you, you, you follow the music. If you're, if you're looking at a bowl, you're, you're seeing it and, and touching it. And th this engages our um, sense perceptions on a journey whose purpose is not to take us towards the object, but is to, is to, is to take us back, uh, to, 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 to trace the experience backwards towards the, 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 the viewer, the knower, the perceiver. Uh, such as that the, the, the separate knower g collapses and, and there is this apparent merging of the subject and the object. Of course, it's not a real merging because the difference between them was only conceptual in the first place, but nevertheless, it felt very real. So yes, whilst in theory we know the subject-object relationship is, 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 is um, conceptual, in practice we feel it very strongly and it takes something powerful to collapse that distinction. And, and such is the power of a true work of art, such is the power of a poem, a poem that is, uh, that, that is um, sourced in this understanding, uh, a dance, a meal, a, a bowl, whatever, that, whatever object is sourced in this understanding has within it this almost magical power to, to, to collapse the subject object relationship and to affect this this intimacy, this absence of separation that, that you refer to, Henry. So that's just a um, uh, yeah, just a response to to to, to the, a word that you used it was kind of the essence of what I think you were were, were speaking of, Henry. This this this, this mm -hmm. utter intimacy that this 
absence of otherness but that is the nature of reality it, 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 art as such it is a uh, it's an intervention a, a work of art is an intervention in our normal dualistic way of perceiving that that, that has this power mm -hmm. to as, as Cezanne said to, to give us a taste of nature's eternity not the idea we've all got the idea of we all have the idea of oneness that, that, that uh, lots of us have that but this is this is visceral it's, it's not the idea of oneness it's the taste of, of oneness the taste of nature's eternity this pure intimacy without otherness yes 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 I've, it's beautifully put beautifully put that's I, I agree entirely um let's just see one thing i might just pick up on is just the question of whether i mean in a certain sense, the the kind of thing that that really fired me up as a as a as a youth you know, in the literary realm it it wasn't <clears throat> it was some sense that you know I, I was particularly into actually among many other things i got into the poetry of of the tang dynasty you know the 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 Chan poets who would had given up life in the city and were sort of wandering the mountains and gorges and writing these beautiful poems that were snapshots from their from their lives, little vignettes you know just uh, often just a few lines long that were made up of images and and that would give you this i mean they would interrupt the 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 linearity of yes. of life so to speak there's sudden yes uh, you know pause and immersion in a person's moment you know yes. 1200 years ago that immediately brought a stop in the reader's life 1000 years later they yes. had the same capacity to to just not be going from A to B, to suddenly, actually, there's this other way of experiencing that is not, uh, you know, linear. That is, yes. it, it, it is, and an, you know, the, a glimpse of boundlessness. I think it, that's exactly right. The, I actually did not know that quote says, our nature's eternity. That's, that's exactly it. But there's something, there's, I don't know, I just, I just, it's a little, uh, tiny little glitch I'm feeling about saying that using words is necessarily conceptual. I mean, of course, that must be right. But there's something about the power of the imagination, you know, the faculty of, of actually having a kind of sense experience, but it's in the imagination that, that, you know, the poem can, can bring to life a scene in the reader's mind. So it's not quite the same as sort of thinking about concepts in the sense of ideas. It's, 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 it's making an experience of life come alive in, I suppose, sense memory or something, but it's, you know, the imaginative faculty where we do sort of see things and taste things and hear things, you know, the sound of the wind in the trees and the you know, the sun glittering on a lake, at sunset or something, those kinds of images, um, they create, I mean, it's a small point really, but just, I feel there's some distinction to be made between, um, I don't know, more of a sort of intellectual slash conceptual, you know, reckoning of things through ideas versus what can be a very visceral experience that the imagination uh, brings us to. I'm just kind of thinking of Wordsworth actually a bit because he he was amazing on this subject. How how you know he would be he would remember with pen in hand you know looking at the lake in the evening or, or in the hills around and 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 he could summon the sense of you know these these sights not only being somehow immediately present later, but also not only at the time he saw them, but also now as he's writing, the force they have on him. And, and you know, he was blessed with, from I think from a young age actually, with glimpses of the oneness 
and of the boundlessness, you know, and regarded the hills as his teachers because that's what they could show him. And, and what I think I value above all maybe in writing or in imaginative writing or creative writing or poetry especially, you know, is its power to, to make us alive through the imaginative faculty. And it's, so it's not a, you know, it's not a matter of sort of philosophizing. It, of yeah. course it's not. I mean, we both know that. So there's some, the, there's some equivalence between, you know, the, the, the beauty of a fine ceramic, its shape in the eye and the patterning and the, and, you know, the touch if we're, if we're in the presence of it and, um, and able to touch it. There's some equivalence between that and what happens in the imagination. Yes. Henry, I, I think maybe I was not, maybe I didn't express myself clearly. I, I completely agree with you, with what you, um, what you say about um, concepts that, that, that poetry doesn't it, um, involve us. It, it's not a conceptual way of, of uh, I, I didn't mean to imply that. All, all I meant to imply was that poetry, by definition, uses concepts. Mm -hmm. I, I, I smiled when you um, spoke of Wordsworth because literally, as you were, were talking, and I was, I was um, uh, thinking exactly what I'm expressing now. That that what I had meant to say was that poetry uses concepts, but to point towards that which is preconceptual. The uh, the first lines of um, a Wordsworth, well known, which you, you you I'm sure know off by heart. The first the the, the lines of Wordsworth. A Wordsworth poem from Tintin Abbey were, were literally running through my mind as you were speaking. Then you mentioned his name. It was a lovely little syn synchronicity. But 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 to, to to take for instance this poem, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the with the joy of elevated thoughts, a, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused. Th th these are all these words. They're all concepts. Every single word is a is a concept. All I meant to say is that a, a poem uses concepts, and, and th th this poem or this part of the poem is, is very specifically pointing towards this sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused. So he was pointing immediately away from God. He wasn't engaging people in a conceptual process. No, he was trying to take people to the heart of reality, which he sees in, 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 the, in, in the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man. It's, so they were, they were concepts are, are just his his tools, like, like uh, as you say, for, for an artist, um, uh, sound, uh, tastes, in my case, as, as, as a potter, clay, touch, they, they, these, are, they, they, these are our materials, your materials as, as, a, as, as a poet or a writer are words, concepts, but, but the purpose is, is of course, uh, I agree, to, 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 to take you immediately to something that is preconceptual. So I, I would entirely agree with that and didn't mean, I'm sorry if I implied that I, that, that poetry somehow engaged you in a conceptual process. I, I, I didn't, I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, so, so th thank you um, for raising that. And I also, I just can't resist the, the, the temptation of, of um, commenting on, on uh, what you said initially ab about a work of art being an interruption in the in, in our linear way of, of experiencing it. and and that is exactly what, what i what i feel that that um that normally we 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 are engaged our minds are engaged in, in 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 the horizontal dimension of time and that a, 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 a poem a, a three line tang poem a, a cup and saucer um, the, 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 the the taste the, the taste of a delicious these have the power to to reel the mind in, to bring back the mind from its adventure and time and space. It, it's an interruption of the horizontal line of time, and it's, it, it, it takes us into this plunge into the vertical dimension of being. It's not really the taste that we like. It's not really the poem that we enjoy. It's not really the cup and saucer in our hand. That, that, that we appreciate what we 
what we love, what we long for, is this plunge into the vertical dimension of, of our being. So we, we come out, in, 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 in other words, the, the, the object is we, we, we come out of time and we taste eternity. So the, the, the work of art is like a portal, yeah. which has the power to take us out of time into eternity. And that's what everybody is longing for. Everything that we ever desire, all we ever really desire is to be taken out of time in which separation, uh, du duality, conflict, etc. exist. We, 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 we long to be taken to that place in ourself, which is inherently at, 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 at peace and one with everyone and, and everything. And uh, so I, I like very much what you say as a work of art, as, as an interruption, a, a, a portal through which we pass out of time into eternity. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, beautiful, beautifully put again. Yes, it's like a, it's like the, um, it is a portal suddenly into, into what, what cannot be compassed, what has no limit. So yes. it, we, yes. we, we, we go from the sort of 3D, which is essentially limited, finite, and, 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 and open into what it, it is a, it's another sense of dimensionality entirely, or, you know, even Zen might say no dimension or who knows, you know, but we're, yes. we, we, we yes. burst the bubble. We, we're, we're out of the, the restriction. And hey, here, here's another thing that I want to just bring in. I'm not sure whether this is so relevant in, in ceramics or I don't know how this plays in, but there's also this side of literature, you know, I'm thinking of like, I mean, my great love of uh, my favorite novelist by far is Tolstoy. And, and I, I wonder why. And I think it's because we follow these people who are searching for exactly what we're talking about. And, but we're not only interested in the moments they find it. We're also interested in their struggles to find it. They're, the twists and turns of their journey that we identify with so closely, somehow even to be participating in their journeys when they're not yet finding it is so, um, it has some deep therapeutic value for us to be yes. empathizing that closely with some, somebody it's, else yes. going through it. So, you know, yes. it, it touches the, the our true search, even just to have our true search sort of recognized and validated and affirmed through a literary character, that's already healing. Even, you know, and that already does something to our own sense of isolation and separateness that here is, here is a, a master, you know, Tolstoy or whoever it may be, I mean, because thousands of other writers who can do this, you know, showing us what it is that we most deeply yearn for, even when we haven't yet found it, or even when the character in the story hasn't yet found it, already that is affirming and healing and, yes. and sort of confirms us in our intimations and intuitions of what our deeper quest really is, if you see what I mean. So, so there's a, I'm just wanting to bring in this other sort of side of art for me personally, and, and I feel it listening to Beethoven or something. There's turmoil and tumult and, and difficulty and, and it resolves at some point. But even when it's still in quest of its resolution, it's so powerful and helpful to experience it. And so I think there's something about the narrative element of, you know, of that, that is so healing. Actually, I, you know, this is a little bit of a side, but when I was a, a student at, at university, I was, one of the things I wrote about, I wrote a long essay on um, actually the origins of narrative. And uh, I was doing some anthropology at, at the university, among other things. And, and there, was a, there was this whole sort of school of thought about shamanism and being the origin of oral epics. I, actually, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole on this, but, but the sense that what was the purpose of narrative? You see, the shaman would go on this journey that was a kind of narrative and it would result in, in a healing of, of, of some kind, you know. And, and, and there's a theory that the early 
the earliest stories, of founding stories of at least the, of the Western tradition and others too, emerged from sort of retellings of shamanic journeys. And that, so the very, the, the sort of deepest purpose of narrative, and, and still today, is always a therapeutic one, a healing one. And that must mean, you know, because we know that the, the one great healing is healing the illusory rift of separateness. And so, have I gone too far? No, 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 this is just like, this is, so this is another dimension of art for me, is that yes. the, the, the therapeutic, I mean, that's not exactly the word, but yeah, the, the, the therapeutic side of, of empathizing with, with characters, you know, that's already helps yeah. us in our isolation, but also the, yeah, I think I said enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm I'm just enthu so enthusiastic about what you're saying, Henry. I want to I want to um to join you. I I, I love what you say about um Tolstoy, um that that it's it's about the character's journey as much as about the the what 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 the character finds. And I think this is so true of a great writer. It, but I think what the what a great writer like Tolstoy does. I think it's the same with a great painter is that they it's because of the quality with which they view the narrative of their character's life that they view their character with this um kind of disinterested affection yeah. Yeah. And, and in doing so they place us as the reader in that in that attitude with reference to the character so the, the character can be a criminal the character can be can be a, you know conventionally an, an evil character but somehow because the because the the, the author is equal interested equally in in all their characters so that the author places us in the position in which they are writing and which is always a position of a disinterested affection mm -hmm. and of course they don't explain that to us just by virtue of the fact that we are reading their book. We are placing ourselves in that, in in that position in relation to the characters, and in in other words, the author places us in the right perspective, in relationship to everything that takes place around us. But but in relation to the the narrative of our own lives. Yeah, right. <laughs> and 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 I think it's the same that a, that a great well, a great portrait painter. I was um, in the U.S. recently, and I had a, a, a day in New York before my retreat began. So I went to the Frick Museum. Whenever I go to a, a museum or a gallery, I just choose two or three things to look at and go straight there and look at them and guard my eyes so so, so that they don't get tired looking at other things. Anyway, one of the things I went to look at was this marvelous self portrait of, of Rembrandt's. And I stood in front of it for, for, for at least half an hour. And it, it's like, um, it, it's like uh, in, in, in the Vedantic tradition, it's like Darshan. All, all I was looking at was a portrait of an old man. Could have been any old man, but it was, and, and it happened to be a self portrait, but it could have been a portrait. It, it, it's true of his other portraits of, of, of his subjects have this same quality. It was the, it wasn't the quality of what he was looking at that communicated itself. It was the quality with which he was looking yes, that yes, communicated yes. itself. He placed me in the position that he was in when he was looking at myself. And so I felt this, this disinterested affection. And it was, it's, so it's not, it's not about the object. The object, the purpose of the object is, is to bring us to this recognition in ourself. And it's tremendously powerful in a, in a, in a novelist like Tolstoy or like Rembrandt or, or, um, in, 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 or the same experience. You listen to Beethoven, Beethoven's late string quartets. They take you to exactly the same experience. Yes. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful. I think I know that very picture in the very room you're talking about in the Frick. Um, Rembrandt's self-portraits are such a perfect example of exactly what you're talking about. And by the way, I think he did a number of them because he couldn't afford he, models, you know? He, 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 yeah, yes, yes. But, but you know, to uh, Chekhov says, 
and that disinterested affection is is perfect. Tost, uh, Chekhov says um, the the to have the ideal blend of irony and sympathy. Oh, that that's perfect. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly, the because the, the, the irony is the disinterested. That's the di- that's the distance. That's the that's the witness position in the Vedantic tradition. But it's yes. not a cold, distant, aloof witnessing. It's a loving <laughs> witnessing. It, 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 yes, exactly. There's sympathy there as well. It's disinterested and affectionate. Exactly. Yes. I love that. I've never I've never heard that before. That's beautiful. I, yes. I, I, irony and sympathy. Exactly. Yes. 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 And. Um, yeah, he. I'm just thinking. I mean, in a way, that's how I would understand a sort of proper mindfulness. Is that it is? It's because uh, it can, it can, it can, it can get construed in so many ways. But I think the the real meaning of it is something very like exactly what you're talking about: disinterested affection. I think that's what yes. you know. The true mindful witness is 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 very compassionate, but also clear it's cold and warm at the same time <laughs> it's exactly yeah. distant you and close it. yes that's right it, because it's because essentially because really it's coming from a much bigger vantage yes it's yeah, looking yeah, from, yeah. A, from a boundless perspective transcendent and imminent it, it's, it's exactly it's both, it's both. <laughs> yes right. it's not that's one or the other yes that's right that's right and that maybe this this is another avenue on why we love art so much because it is yes. it, it, it exactly switches that on in us, and exactly, and, yeah. yeah. And so, it's, it's, go on, go on. well, I was just thinking, just just what a wonderful thing it is actually that 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 can in fact be conveyed, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And isn't it? Is, and, yes. And maybe this is one of the best things about art that of all the means of conveying it, it may be the best that that actually no 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 yes. endless amounts of sort of spiritual guidance and instruction that are trying to do that may not do it as effectively as yeah. one single beautiful yeah. pop. And this is why even when we're destitute, we're in a concentration camp, art is the last thing to go, not the first thing to go. Why? Because it's not some superfluous bourgeois luxury. It it It, it is about the most real and essential thing in our life. And it is the most one of the most powerful means of precipitating that experience in us. We're happy to give up everything else beyond death's door, but we still make art. Yes, yes, because it's about who we really are. Yes. So, yes. so, so no matter the pursuits we may be in, in our sort of supposed outward life, quote unquote outward life, always there's a core concern, a core fact, a core reality, which is who and what we really are. And, and at any time, that will sort of, forgive the word, trump everything else, because yes. it's the most important thing. Yes, it's, exactly. It, it's more important than all our pursuits. You know, and yes. this, again, this is something that, oh man, when Tolstoy's got a number of fantastic death scenes, as you, you, you may well know. Uh, I think they say there's four great deaths in Tolstoy. And, and, you know, in all of them, that's what happens is that the character, you know, in, in, is in some degree of struggle and resistance and objection to what's happening. And, 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 um, and then suddenly, because, because they're suddenly sort of in one way or another in these great deaths, they're, they're tripped into a recognition of who they really are, which makes the process of death almost unimportant. It's the finding of what they really are makes death unimportant to them. And, and that, 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 that can happen at any time, you know, yes. you don't need to be on death's door, you know, at, at any point to, to, to be, tripped, cajoled, coaxed, whatever, into the recognition of what we really are, makes all other concerns small. Yes. And in, in, in this context, death is, is uh, as you said, Henry, earlier, it is the ultimate interruption. 
<laughs> and, and it has the same power. Uh, if, if, if a work of art is, is, a, is a mini interruption in, in the horizontal flow of time, de de death is the ultimate interruption. <laughs> and, and, and hence, a, 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 as you say, for, for so many people, that the, the imminence of death, it has this, uh, a, has this power to it, yes, to, 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 to bring us to our core sense of who we really are. Yes, yes. And that turns out to be kind of the most important thing. Yes. And I suppose it comes with, I mean, I'm just thinking again of the, um, somehow the sort of, uh, the, 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 the healing here, you know, because when we discover that, it so reor reorients us toward all else. And, and we find that, you know, whether, whether the disinterested affection, you know, has been towards, is now towards ourselves, but it's also towards all and all beings and, and everybody else yeah. in our lives. Yeah. So it has this, I, I, I want to say it has a sort of moral function in a very broad sense of the word moral, in that it, in, in that it switches on compassion. And I, that, that's something that's, that's, uh, that's, um, uh, it's brought to the fore to some extent, I guess, in the Zen way that I've been most deeply trained in. Actually, it's making me want to ask about, because I, I, having listened to you on various various venues, Rupert, I, I've heard you talk about your, your um, deep training. And actually, you know, when Steve was talking at the start, I mean, I have had various key poetry mentors, actually, but I also, but when it came to my spiritual practice, which I only really got into a serious training process after I'd already had a, a couple of what I guess what I would call awakening experiences. And, but to enter a real tutelage, an apprenticeship, um, turned out to be crucially important for me and um, I get the sense that it was for you too with, I've heard you talk about actually your that. early years, you were already in some kind of spiritual context. I think I remember hearing you say, and then found your way to, yeah, Francis Lucille. Yes. And Jean Klein, maybe, I'm not sure. No, I never met Jean Klein, but, but you're, you're, you're quite right, Henry. I, I did these, in a way I did two traditional apprenticeships. Uh, one, one in relation to, to my work as an artist and one in relation to my, my, my interest in the nature of reality. And, and the first was with Michael Cardew, who was uh, one, one of the, along with Bernard Leach, one of the founding fathers of the British studio pottery movement. And I lived with him for the last two years of his life. And, and then with, with, with Francis Lucille. And, and they, as Steve um, said at the beginning, it, the, the trajectory that I traveled on with both of them was uncannily similar. <laughs> uh, although they were in two completely different fields, the, 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 the relationship, um, and in particular, the, the, the extent of my devotion, the extent to which I was willing to submit myself to another person in order to learn what they had to teach. And I was utterly devoted to both of them to, to the extent that I, I kind of gave up my own, my own view. I, I completely immersed myself in, uh, well, in, in, in Michael's case, it was, it was the processes, the, the workshop, the materials, the preparation of the material. It, it, it was the, I completely immersed myself in, in his, in his way, in his approach, in his methods, in his attitudes, in his vision, in his, in his forms. And, and then in Francis in a, in a similar way, but more intellectually. And, um, Francis said to me once, actually, he said, um, he said, most people I can give advice to, but he said, you have to be really careful giving advice to you because I know that if I do, you'll just do it unquestioning. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he, he, so he said, I have to be very careful. Um, because I, I, I was like that. I, I was just, I was so devoted. I had given up my own 
my own um, authority in a way and submitted myself, devoted myself so fully. Um, it was it was devotion to what was being offered, but but that involved a devotion to the person as well. And um, so I felt that it, it enabled me to imbibe, not just learn, but to imbibe very deeply what was on offer. But it, it also came with a shadow in that I had to liberate myself in both cases from both teachers in order to, which didn't involve any kind of re rejection of, of either of them. There was never that. Um, I think it's what they mean in Buddhism. I might be wrong about this, but it's what I've always thought they mean when they say in Buddhism, if you meet the Buddha on the way, kill him. Yeah. It, it's it's that, that you have to, um, you have to make the teaching, whether it, it, it was it, it's in artistic form or in a spiritual context, you have to make what you receive from your mentor, from your friend, from your teacher, you have to make it your own. And then you have to give it your own voice. You have to, you have to give yourself up to begin with, to, 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 to the teacher and the teaching, the, 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 the apprenticeship, the master. You have to give yourself up completely in order to be able to receive, because if you don't give yourself up, you, you can't receive. You have to totally give yourself up. But then, and then you have to take it in very deeply, but then you have to make it your own and not just repeat. You have, you have to forget the form. You've taken the, the heart, you've taken the understanding in, but you'd have to, you have to forget the form. And you don't do that overnight. You don't just reject the form that you've inherited. You have to gradually infuse it with your own particular individual qualities. What you're giving form to is, of course, not individual, it's universal. But you are giving, you are beginning to express it in a way that is uniquely individual. Yes, that yes. depends on your own body and your own mind. That's very, perhaps we don't say not personal, but it, it's individual. And to do that, you have to uh, gradually let go of the form that you inherited from your master or your teacher or and that takes a process, because you've given yourself over so so fully. And it takes a while to reclaim, to find your own voice and to reclaim the understanding, to make it your own, and then to find new ways of, 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 of speaking it or making it or whatever. The, and I had to do both. In both cases, I gave myself very fully. Uh, I took in the understanding in both cases very, very deeply. And then there was this, uh, with Michael Cardew, it was a bit of a battle. <laughs> because he, he remained on my shoulder when I was in my studio. He was always there on my shoulder. You know, what you are allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. It took me, it took me time. And actually, it was only the repeated failures that I experienced in my studio that pushed me through a process whereby I had to make the form my own. So I think it was actually the difficulties, the struggles, the failures that, that helped me to 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 find a language of my own. With Francis, it, was, it wasn't a struggle. It just happened gradually over the years. I just began speaking, using my own, finding my own, because I, I love language and poetry and just finding my, it was, it was, more, it was more effortless in, in, the, in the case. But in both cases, it, it was this process of finding a form, finding a, a unique individual form to express something that is that is not personal, that, that is universal and impersonal. Yes, yes, yes. Beautiful. I, I can, I can so relate to that, actually, in, in, and in both areas. I mean, I had a, I, my deepest apprenticeship in poetry was with a Scottish poet, Douglas Dunn, um, who I, 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 he had one particular book called Elegies, which is just a fantastic book about his wife dying. It's, it's a, a really wonderful, um, a sequence, poetry sequence, you know, um, of, uh, of single but connected or related, closely related poems on the death of his first wife. And um, very, uh, really astounding. And sort of through him, um, actually, avenues into his forebears, his poetic forebears were opened to me through contact with him, you know, through actually um being 
in relationship with a, a live flesh and blood person. It was, it was critical because so much of my poetic formation had happened on the page or through pe poets I, I could never meet because they were already dead or, or, or who I just never would meet because I didn't know them. And I hadn't recognized until I was lucky enough to meet Douglas the, 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 ne the necessity somehow of a real live person in the process of the formation. And, and I spent, uh, uh, around that time, I spent, I don't know, two or three years only writing in, in meter and rhyme, and not always rhyme, but always meter, you know, which I'd never done before since my teen years. I, I was always a free verse poet and then had maybe two or three years of, literally, I don't think I've wrote a single poem that wasn't in meter. And, and most were rhyming, you know, lots, thousands of little sonnets, and and um, not one of them was any good, actually, not one. And, but it was a fantastic training. There was one, and this was, uh, you know, a, a lot of it was under Douglas's sort of urging and doing parodies, close parodies of famous poems, you know, really line by line, word by word, trying to in my, write my own poems that were exactly following the format of those poems. And... Um, and then, uh, you know, one night in the midst of this sort of training, I was, I was actually, I was actually, um, you know, w woke up to go and have a pee. And while I was standing there, I don't want to get too graphic, but just, you know, using the loo, <laughs> um, a poem came, a line, and, and I, I literally grabbed um, the envelope of a gas bill. It was the first thing I saw and just wrote this poem straight out that was once again in free verse and I could feel the teenage poet coming forward, but, but better trained, more in yes. command, you know, more it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have happened if you hadn't, if you hadn't written all those poems in, in exact meter. Somehow that discipline shaped your mind in such a way that when your mind was free and open, when your mind is not focused, it, you know, it's not a coincidence, you were having a pee, you, you, were, you, 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 you're, you were just free and available, nothing, nothing. At that moment, because your mind has been so shaped by, 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 by your discipline, something then new comes into it. Exactly. And, some, and all that training somehow was in there completely unconsciously. Yes, you know, exactly. So, yes. Yeah, it was, it was a new level of capacity to express. And, and uh, that, was, that was very, so that was the first poem that, uh, the first poem that I wrote that would end up in my first uh, collection in Dr. No's Garden. And, but, you know, in the, in, in the spiritual side, um, I, I, I can relate to it. I, but, you know, I, I think I was a more, tr it sounds like I've, I've been a more troubled guy than you. I, 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 <laughs> I had, a, I had a very, you know, in some ways rather difficult childhood. It sort of sounds idyllic from what I was saying earlier, but I, I had a terrible skin condition for most of my early years. And I, I, uh, I was, uh, rec I was, a, I was and, and I had a, a very difficult domestic situation I grew up in. And I was a very sensitive guy, so these things hit me hard. And, and it took a lot of unraveling. And, um, and in the midst of that, I, I was very distrustful, you know, as, as uh, Steve quoted that little bit from my book, One Blade of Grass, earlier about that. But um, it took me, I, I had a, a, a mind-blowing, I think rather profound awakening experience at the age of 19 that sort of changed everything. And um, But I had no idea what to do about it. And it took me years to recognize even that there were people and traditions and schools and whatever who knew about what had happened to me. I, I, just, I just had no idea what it was. I was not, I was reared in, you know, in, in this, um, you know, fairly rationalistic and sort of empiricist um, Oxford background, you know, and the, the one outlet, the one escape from that had been poetry. But I knew nothing about spirituality and 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 what awakening might be, and I, I knew nothing about it. So it took me a long time even to find that there were people who would have understood what that was. And and then I went through a long period of trying to find um, somebody, and I was because I was 
yeah, basically very distrustful. It, it, it took ages before I really did. But then I, I was very devoted to him and to a second teacher in the same sort of lineage that he was in, actually. And, and, and really threw myself into it very deeply and seriously and just trusted it deeply and, and really, I think, imbibed it. I totally relate to that. Really immersed, soaked, dissolved in it in some sense. Ultimately, you know, really dissolved sort of, sort of completely thoroughly and, and, um, and sort of came, came out of it. They say in, in Zen actually, people have a lot of ideas about Zen and, and I certainly did and, uh, and, but in fundamentally, it really, I think, isn't in the end trying to do something very different from Vedantic, you know, training, non-dual training. I think it's very much the same territory. Um, but there was a point in Zen, they talk about the Zen death, which, which really is just a, you know, really thoroughly self is just gone, you know, more thoroughly than before. And, and more consistently we can reside, be something more encompassing, you know. But there's also a sense that in the phrase Zen death, that Zen dies, the training process dies. That, you know, because in a sense it must, if we're, if we're really opening to what has no name, what has no size, what has no time, what has no place, you know, if we're really thoroughly becoming that, which of course we've always been, but really released from all the things that obscured it thoroughly, then even something like a training process must also vanish, you know, and, and so, and so then we're free, you know, to, yes. to allow that to express itself through the individuality of who we each are. And it's so beautiful that it sort of wants us to do that our own way. It, it, it wants us to be who we are, you know, and to use our particular, um, way of expressing it to be who we are in some sense you know and so I, I can yeah I, I'm just uh, really just sort of agreeing with you very much about that yeah. yes and perhaps one just to just to, to comment on your on your last point there Henry one of the most I don't know it's the most difficult thing but something that's very important and, and sometimes difficult um for those of us that have been very devoted um, to a, a teacher, a lineage, a tradition, a practice, um, some kind of form, is that w w when we recognize that our essential being shares none of the limitations of our objective experience, that, 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 that it is free, independent of any kind of form or structure or, or limitation, then we, we at, at the deepest level, we know that we are independent of, uh, of any tradition, of any teacher, of any particular formulation of, of, of the teaching, of any series of practices. We, we are free, we are independent, which doesn't mean to say necessarily that we may not continue speaking about these matters in the same tradition in which we grew up. We, we may continue to do that, but we may not. It doesn't mean to say that we lose respect for the, 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 the teachers, the friends, the mentors along the way. But we, we don't, the, the, there is also a kind of freedom and independence from them. We don't feel we belong to um, any, any particular tradition or lineage or person or teacher, although we may still hold whatever path we took in, 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 in great respect, and, and, and we may acknowledge that and, and honor that, but inside there's a, a feeling of, of, of freedom from any of these forms, which gives us then the freedom when we're sharing our understanding, such, such as it is, to, 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 to use d different forms, not, not, not to be, and that's, I think, how, a, to, to me, that's the real tradition. 
the real tradition, the real lineage is not a, a lineage that goes from one person to another person to another person to another person. Although that is a, I, I'm not meaning to disrespect that. That is a, a valid um, tradition. It's a valid, valid lineage on one level. But I think the real lineage is the lineage of, of people who have recognize the freedom and the independence, the autonomy of their own being, yes. and the unlimited and um, unconditioned nature of their own being and speak about it in a way that is tailored to their own time and place, their own who, who have the ability to reformulate the perennial understanding in a way that is uniquely and specifically tailored to the difficulties and the objections and the questions that are raised in their in their local community, in their street, with the people that they're meeting with. And that that is a kind of tradition of its own. To me, that's the real lineage. It's the kind of hidden, it's the hidden tradition. It's the tradition with a capital T. Yeah. And as I say, I, I don't say that with any disrespect to the more relative traditions. I'm as, as um, I think you you know, I'm, I'm very respectful of the, the traditions that I've been brought up in, the, my teachers, and, and and I also think it's important to um, to liberate oneself from those traditions, and 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 then to be to be free to to to, to tailor one's understanding such as it is to to the moment, whatever that requires. And after all, isn't that what the the, the originators of the great religious and spiritual traditions? We're doing Jesus was not a Christian. The Buddha was not a Buddhist. Right. <laughs> they, they, they were, all, all their traditions came after them. They, I'm not say that I'm not suggesting that they didn't have their own um, teachers or, but um, yeah. they, they were tailoring their understanding to the particular time and place in which they um, in which they spoke. In fact. Uh, Dr. Rose, the very first teacher I ever had, he said to, to, to me once, he, he said, um, uh, the teaching, the understanding needs to be reformulated by every generation. Yes. And yes. that's, I think, if we don't do that, the teaching then becomes a series of concepts and dogmas and practices. It becomes, it's like canned food. Yeah, it's food, but it's not really nourishing. It's not like a fresh food. It's, yes, it's and and the teaching needs to be fresh. It needs to come out of the out of the depth of our understanding, not not out of the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautifully put. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, actually, I, I've I've been uh, developing a new program that I've called Original Love, which is um, all traditions. Are, 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 no tradition is excluded. You know, it, it, but they're not really the point. The point is what they all point to what they're all means to find. And what, and I, I very much, uh, I, I very much like you've just been describing this, like that with a tradition with a capital T. Exactly, it's, it's, it's always about how does, how does reality and meaning the, the deep truth of who and what we are and what all this is, how does it need to, uh, how does it need to show itself, express itself, meet now? What, what does it need to be? What does it need to be doing now? And actually the great uh, Zen poet, master, teacher Dogen, you know, he said it's utterly untrammeled. There's no exactly. limit yes. to, yeah, yeah. Yes. no limit to how yes. it can express itself. And it's, 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 it's sort of job is, so to speak, it's functioning is just to, to do that, to, to show itself, express itself, be itself. And in a way, and our job, I guess, as teachers, is just to facilitate uh, now how each person can discover their own total total participation in that total total um, own sort of own authority, as it were, in being that. And um, it's uh, I, I I agree entirely the that relationship to a tradition, a school, a lineage by which we may have been trained. I mean, that that should want us really, in the end, it should want us to be free. Exactly. To, yeah. Otherwise it hasn't fulfilled its function. Exactly, it hasn't liberated you. Exactly, exactly. Yeah.
And yeah, yeah no, it's, it's an issue because it's very easy. I mean, actually, Buddha said somewhere that, you know, there's five kinds of clinging and one of them is clinging to the forms of one's spiritual training. Yeah, if, if, if you're still attached to your teacher, your teacher hasn't done a very good job. Exactly. <laughs> 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 haven't done. <laughs> so someone says something like, you know, our job is not to create followers, it's to create yeah, leaders. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, Steve, Henry and I are getting completely carried away. We'll, <laughs> we'll carry on talking all night at, at this rate. We're completely ignoring you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to bring that up. We, we haven't we haven't left you a a, a, a sort of a, a window for you to for, for you to join us. So so um, apologies, but please um, join us. Um, uh, sh share your your understanding if, if if you'd like to, unless you're happy just for Henry and I to keep going. But do 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 please um, join us if you'd like to. Uh, well, yes, I am delighted by what I'm witnessing, actually. So don't mind me. That being said, <laughs> now, now that you have given an inch, <laughs> let, me, let, me take, let me take a mile. Um, well, actually, really, you, you've both of you gone this tremendous arc, actually, from the beginning to the end. You've you've tra you've gone from the beginning of your training, although you sort of went back to the beginning, actually. You talked about art and spirituality in general. Then you went back to the beginning, talking about mentorship and all sorts of things like this. And now you're even emerging beyond that into its implications for your current activities. So it, I think it's a complete arc, yes. uh, what we've done here. Um, yes, what a wonderful uh, conversation. Just, I'm just so staggered by this. It's just so fa fantastic. And I must, I think, petition you both for a sequel. Um, we have uh, covered such rich ground here, but I'm, I'm now even more curious than when we began. One thing we haven't talked about that I would like to discuss with you both later, uh, if we do a sequel, is the process, the artistic process. Uh, Henry, you just dis dis uh, described almost an ecstatic inspiration uh, as a means of uh, your artistic process, poems just coming to you in a sort of rush like that. Rupert, in our conversation, you've talked about your the daily discipline of the of the of the studio, of the workshop, um, seeing your pots come out of the kilns and seeing only the imperfections and being driven by that back into the studio. Mm. So, now I I don't suspect that those two dimensions are the only dimensions of of your both of your artistic processes. Nonetheless, it's an interesting juxt juxtaposition that I would like to explore with you. And also, what what makes effective art from the process point of view? There's a concept in Japanese art, I believe it's Hana, this idea of union of emptiness with the artistic process. And uh, the idea somehow that the disposition of the artist can uh, have some effect on the artwork itself, that using the art almost as a, as a discipline itself. Mm. Does the artist need to be in a transcendental state to elicit that? Um, is it possible to uh, be pointed to that pre prior conceptual place or a time or non-time or non-place uh, when the artist is ignorant of it? Uh, what uh, is required on the artist's point of view from a process point of view? I think that's something that would be very rich to explore. Also, both of you now, we've talked much of your time as devotees or apprentices, could we say. I'm also curious, now you both are in the position of the master, archetypally speaking. I know you don't like to necessarily conceive of it that way, uh, but archetypally speaking, Rupert, you yourself in your ceramic studio had apprentices as you were apprenticed to Michael Cardio. Both of you, of course, um, teaching in your own uh, in your own ways have students whether you call them students or you know friends on the path or whatever however you want to say that archetypally speaking that's your role now part part of your role perhaps i'm wrong about that it seems that way mm -hmm. so i'd be really interested to explore from the master's point of view um how one uh, goes about accomplishing the process that you've described from the apprentice point of view these are two themes anyway that i think i would i would love to explore with you both perhaps uh, in a sequel 
Well, but b- both very interesting um, topics, Stephen, and, and we we could you know we could we, we could explore just just one of those questions in 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 an hour. But 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 yes, it's been r- really a pleasure to have this conversation, and and I'd be very very happy to 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 resume and and discuss these 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 issues. Yes, certainly. Mm, yeah, definitely. Me too. Yeah, very very happy. Uh, to this has been totally totally fascinating and uh, more than that very sort of a yes exactly. feel it my heart's very warm yes, and full yes, and excited yes, and yes. very happy to connect with you again Stephen and 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 of course you Rupert for the first time like this it's it's very uh, it feels very um I'm very moved actually um you know it seems like a a wonderful thing to be able to sense this sort of uh you know collegiality or you know absolutely yes yeah comrade and or whatever yeah. you know comrades yes. of some kind you know it's very wonderful yes. there aren't so many people that i there's a few people that well of course i have very close poetry colleagues i've had and definitely close sort of you know folks in the spirituality but the people who really are open in both those avenues and see a way of holding them as one sort of thing it's very rare for me yes. it's like it's a very special thing i agree um henry you, you meet someone for the first time and you feel they're an old friend it's a very particular quality of of, of um connection and uh, where you don't have to know a lot about each other you know we we talked before as steve said we, we talked for 10 minutes before this conversation about our, our shared life in oxford but we know Almost nothing about each other, and 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 yet, and and and, and likewise with with you, Steve. We, we we don't need. It's not necessary to know a lot about each other if there's this deep connection in the heart. And and um, yes, I've I've too been very very touched by this conversation. Thank you, Rupert Spira and Henry Shukman. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. And thank you both as well. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.